And so no fail is just kind of bringing it back to like, hey man, what were you taught when you learned how to ride a bike? Having a flyer go off somewhere else is almost as serious as a little shot going off somewhere else. I think because, I mean, the original weapon lights that were issued were like, what, 60 lumens or something like yep. that? Yeah. Hey everyone, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to ModCast. Today is September 29th, 2021. The episode number is 274. We're going to be talking about catering to your demographic. So what that kind of means is when you're setting up a lesson plan or you're teaching a class, how to focus on the specific group you're going to be teaching. Uh, for some, that might be kind of difficult. I've had some really cool experiences with that. Great discussions with other instructors about this. And we're going to kind of dissect this whole process tonight. Um, wonderful panel tonight, as per the norm. But first, before we start, let's, uh, let's address those, those sponsors. Big thanks to Big Tech's Ordnance. Basically, Big Tech's is one of those companies that they just seem to be on the cutting edge of all the cool stuff. Everything from the, the latest in lights, in suppressors, in how they have everything, you name it. I'm surprised they don't have like seasonings and things like that. It's probably coming like their own signature wine. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, big techs, great, uh, great people. And they're also associated with a lot of our friends. And when I say friends, I mean like all the people that associate with primary and secondary. So that's really cool. Also, a big thank you to Filster Holsters, another uh, friend of a lot of friends. Uh, Filster is an awesome company, awesome people. Uh, matter of fact, right now I'm, I'm wearing one of their pro series with a 43X. Um, basically, if you're looking for cutting edge designs and basic, basically the latest and greatest in holsters. Um, Filsters, Filsters pretty much it. There are a lot of other companies that copy. Another cool thing with Filster is they get along with all the good guys. Um, so we're talking Dark Star. We're talking, we're talking Henry. We're talking all these great companies. Um, they all, they all kind of support each other and they, they work well together. And Filster is just an absolute leader when the, when it comes to this stuff. It's uh, they're, they're so good. They're now, they're basically, they're memed all the time because so many people just are able to trust them. I guess that's just something that people find that, that it's necessary to make fun of. I don't know. Um, also big thank you to primary arms. If you are active military, a veteran or a first responder, primary arms government wants to help you get the best prices available on guns, gear, and more. With over 500 brands and 1,500 different product stock, Primary Arms carries one of the most comprehensive selections of tactical hunting and competition products. Their mil military and law enforcement discount program gives an additional 10% off of many of the most sought after brands, including Benelli, Noveski, Sons of Liberty Gunworks, and Wilcox Industries. For more information, visit Primary Arms. They also have a lot of optics and it's it's been cool they've sent me some of these optics and as a matter of fact i have one on let's see here on that guy right there right there and if you're just listening and and, and you don't see what i'm doing i'm pointing at the wall behind me uh, that has uh various primary arms optics on them um they've been they've been they've been good i haven't had any issues with them i have had a couple issues with some battery life and i don't know if it's the battery or if it's the optic um but they are going to be beat to hell soon and i can't wait that's the, that's the way you figure out if this stuff works i guess um also big thank you to staccato so i do carry a staccato on duty let's see here there's at least one right there and there's one right there again pointing at the wall if you're listening you're missing out um basically if you're if 2011s or 1911s might have some kind of an appeal Staccato is a good, pla good place to go for going with a nine millimeter double stack 1911 style pistol, which is the modern 2011. Uh, Joe Chambers did a review of the P-Series and it got some pretty good, good, uh, good marks. Basically, it was a good value for the price. And a lot of people look at the price and go, oh, no, that's way too much. But it's a great gun. I, again, I, uh, I, I've, I've been a fan. They've been, they've been, uh, it's just such a fun gun to shoot. And I, as I've said in the past, 2011s and 1911s were a little scary with that manual safety, but a little practice and it works out just fine. Speaking of guns, Walther Arms. So looking at the wall again, we have a couple PDPs up here. Also the Q4 steel frame, uh, uh, PPQ, PPS, 
Walther has been a great, great sponsor for the, uh, for the podcast. They wound up actually covering a lot of uh, law enforcement um, slots at the, at the training summit, which was wonderful. It was great to be able to offer these uh, positions to law enforcement officers, but also their, their guns are pretty dang cool. As far as striker fired pistols are concerned, I really found the PDP or excuse me, the PPQ was absolute best for, for you have a wonderful trigger press or the trigger is awesome. The, the, the grip texture, you know, I liked it. The ergonomics of it, it worked well for me. It was a great shooting gun. They kind of stepped it up with the PDP and improved everything and then some, and pretty much all the PDPs. Yeah. They're, they're all optic ready. Great texture, uh, good capacity even better capacity because they even have 18 rounder full size guns as I'm pointing up, if you can't see. Um, but the trigger also is outstanding. And I compared the two PPQ and the PDP side by side. I like the PDP better. Yeah. Lastly, big thank you to the Patreon subscribers without your support. We wouldn't have been able to do the training summit training summit was awesome. We're doing it, doing it again next year. I'm also going to be giving away a lot of free spots because once I'm able to pay the bills for the event, I can open the floodgates and we can let in all these people to take advantage of this awesome opportunity. So we have the venue, we have the instructors, we have the space. Why not take advantage of it? And it's a waste if we just let spots go and, and just have them waste away and no one uses them. So why don't we take advantage of that? So as soon as bills are paid with this, this whole big, uh, training summit as soon as i can pay all the bills with all the instructors it's I, I start giving away all the slots and it's awesome and i love to be able to do that uh the feedback i've gotten from people also for this opportunity has been wonderful so i think it is time to officially start the show and maybe even add some of the panelists and i probably need to put on my ears so i can actually hear them talk because that's good uh so yeah my background's in law enforcement been doing the cop thing for over 20 years now I personally started as an instructor. I want to say it was in, I think it was 04 when I was sent to the post um, police officer. It was like the pistol instructor course. It was pistol and shotgun. Then I went to the long gun school and it was uh, really disappointing, especially looking back, knowing what I know now, if anything, it was a, 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 an opportunity to check the box, but um, it's been a wonderful opportunity as an instructor to, to grow, to grow the network, uh, to compare notes with other instructors. And of course, that's probably the wife calling me right now as per the norm. <laughs> yep. And that's resolved by Foo Fighters. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I've, I've loved being an instructor. I've, I've loved to try to help anywhere I can. Uh, it's, been a wonderful journey and it's exciting to talk to people that are excited about it that are just getting into it and i get questions on a regular basis where do i start and i i love helping people out with that question so that's pretty much the extent of my background as far as this topic is concerned how about you brian uh, I started in, I don't even want to say, uh, 1978 training in martial arts. <laughs> so that ages the whole thing quite a bit. Uh, I, I have, four. yeah, yeah. I have, uh, five different black belts that are teaching levels and above. Uh, I've spent my whole time as a private and se sector coach. Uh, I did a brief stint in law enforcement, worked for the Fulton County Sheriff's office in the reserve department. Uh, and I decided that I was much better off coaching and that was where my passion truly, uh, led me to, I, I fought professionally in most of the major systems as far as Muay Thai and submission grappling and MMA. And, uh, my wife looked at me and told me I was getting a little too old for all that stuff. And I might want to take better care of myself. Getting punched in the head was a bad idea. So, uh, I moved into something much safer, like firearms instruction, <laughs> <laughs> which was a, a good choice. It really is. But uh, my specialty is really in the, uh, in, in people, in coaching people. I have about a hundred thousand hours in the private sector of coaching people because I've worked for myself. And as everybody knows, you know, especially Matt, when you do anything on your own, you can work at least 12 hours a day doing it. So uh, I'm really good with the mental management side. We have an image based decisional drill. We do the complete combatant, which I founded. And that has a, a broad implication for the armed citizen. Cool. 
And Chris. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Chris Seifert. I work for a company called Citizens Fence Research along with my partners, John Johnson and Melody Lauer. And uh, I'm the junior partner of CDR. I just joined them last year. Uh, and I've been uh, uh, working there, uh, teaching some classes here and there. Prior to that, I spent 20 years in the United States Army. The majority of that time I spent as a Special Forces non-commissioned officer, a Green Beret. And uh, if, if for the viewers that know anything about Green Berets, we're actually primarily teachers, uh, typically teaching uh, our, our partners and I was an Arabic speaker. Uh, so I spent, you know, a lot of time teaching stuff in Arabic, uh, everything from basic rifle marksmanship to heavy weapons, to tactics, you name it. Then I also spent three and a half years at our uh, special warfare center, teaching advanced skills to green berets, Navy SEALs, Marine Raiders. Uh, and a lot of that was, uh, operational concepts and cognitive processes as much as it was technical skills. And uh, since I've retired, I've tried to take a lot of that and translate it to a uh, civilian populace because citizen defense research primarily teaches citizens. And uh, I'm a firm believer in like, for example, John Johnson, my partner is a great technical shooter. If somebody wanted technical shooting, uh, like I can teach folks, but he is, he is a better technical shooter than I am. I try to bring the, the cognitive process that I've learned and how to approach um, violence or potential violence uh, in a cerebral manner so that we can set the conditions left of bang to stack the odds in our favor to make the technical shooting problem, if it becomes necessary, relatively simple. And that's kind of been my focus is helping citizens think holistically about self, uh, self-preservation. Cool. Tessa? Uh, so I run a YouTube channel called Armed and Styled as well as an Instagram. Um, my background per se is I got into concealed carry. I didn't get into guns or enjoyed shooting at all. I got into concealed carry um, about two years ago and I quickly realized that there wasn't a lot of content out there for the beginner, um, particularly the beginner that wasn't uh, into the super duper tactical mindset or tactical look. Um, So I wanted to create and curate something like that uh, for the beginner. So For the last year and a half, um, I've been learning a lot. Um, There was a lot I didn't know, and there's still a lot I don't know. Um, So I I create content for the beginner concealed carrier, and I focus a lot on concealment. And there's not enough of that. It's unfortunate. There's so much content created for the beginner that is tactical, that's over the top, and it's silly. And it's also turning off a lot of people as well. I think that it's becoming, uh, I think that a lot of people are realizing that in in the tactical community um, as well, that that's really, really saturated and that it is, it can be a turnoff, especially to people that are just stepping into it um, or are stepping into it in a really practical, I'm, you know, I'm just a citizen wanting to defend myself. Um, I think that there's, we're going to see a lot more information coming out for that demographic yeah yeah Uh, i look forward to that because we are in desperate need of level heads giving good information and good insights that's not all decked out in multicam unlike riley's hat um yeah i like this hat (laughs) (laughs) so speaking of riley (laughs) so uh i I got my start, what I would consider professionally, a little more than 10 years, let's see, probably 2010, became an instructor, uh, first an NRA instructor, like a lot of folks. Uh, Why did I do that? I don't know. I guess I thought I had something I could share with people. I didn't know a lot of things back then. Uh, Shortly thereafter, I went into uh, a law enforcement auxiliary agency here in Colorado, that later turned into reserve, uh, statewide reserve capacity. I did that for eight years, became an agency instructor. And so that was my audience there for, for a time, enjoyed that very much, uh, because I had my day job, but I enjoyed serving on the nights and weekends, um, just cause I liked finding a, an outlet to give back, uh, began teaching some concealed carry classes, doing that sort of thing that led me to, uh, an opportunity to, you know, my, my current business partner is who I worked with back then as well. Uh, but we just formalized that. And now I work full time for concealed carry.com as a director of training, which really started as a, 
national level network of instructors. And we still have an, um, and maintain a network of, of mostly concealed carry instructors nationwide. Um, but uh, we've, you know, probably the biggest audience that I reach now and, and really my demographic now is through the concealed carry podcast, which we've been on air for five and a half years. And uh, it's kind of crazy actually to say that, but um, that's been, that podcast has been actually part of my own personal growth. It's forced me to, um, to analyze things at a, at a greater level and to find better ways of communicating to our audience uh, the best information and hopefully practices regarding uh, the practice of concealed carry and self-defense um, mindset and, and living. Um, along the way, I've become a competitive shooter and in my actual firearms instruction these days, I'm more geared towards teaching shooting at a, at a performance you know, level, at a high level. Uh, I, my, my, my greatest passion now is helping other shooters shortcut their journey so they can hopefully not struggle like I did for a long time. So, uh, yeah. And a big piece of that and, and similar to, I know that Brian and I probably, well, he's way smarter than I am and uses way fancier <laughs> words than I do, but I know we think similarly in a lot of re respects with, with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, for me, it's all about like people learn better when, as far as shooting, then they, they perform better when they are in the right place mentally, emotionally, and when they can visually process information at a high rate of speed, which is what's happening when, when we're shooting. So that's kind of where I'm at now and, and what I'm passionate the most about trying to communicate that to others. You know, it's interesting because a couple of things you said, and I took notes on this, um, oh, going boy. into the NRA. Yeah. Going to the NRA for the basic school, but then also you said to, that you started analyzing information. And it seems like a lot of uh, basic instructors, they, they grab onto a curriculum, they grab onto curricula, that's Latin, plural. Mm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, but they grab onto that and they don't look at it any further and they just regurgitate. They don't look to get uh, any better. They don't do any of that analysis. And I think that might be the biggest difference between your run of the mill instructor, small town instructor, who's teaching everyone their concealed permit class. And we have nationally recognized instructors who are providing insights and potential life-changing um, yeah, insights, basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, that analysis is so underused. And it's so, and not enough people, I think, recognize how that's critical thinking. It's, it's, it's awesome. And not only is it going to make us better people, it's making instructors better instructors um, versus just regurgitating what we're told. We're going to look at it and we're going to apply it and we're going to cater it to our demographic. So that's what the, the episode's about. <laughs> um, so how do you guys define what your demographic is? For me right now, it's law enforcement. I'm teaching law enforcement basic courses. Uh, unfortunately, in law enforcement, unless we have a lot of funding, we're going to a we're striving for a minimum standard. When I have students or officers that are interested in going beyond that, absolutely, we will go beyond that. We will we will take it to the next level. But unfortunately, most cops aren't gun people, and they're not interested in going beyond what the minimum standard is. That's kind of sad and it's disappointing. But if you, if you, if you keep that, that fire alive and you find those people that are interested in going a little further, it's, it's incredibly rewarding. And then also when you have those students that aren't that interested and the light bulb goes off and they apply something that you've brought up that isn't just regurgitated, that is so rewarding and so wonderful. So Brian, how do you determine what your specific demographic is? And I'm saying, and I'm talking like for a specific class or when you're creating content for, for who do you do this? How do you determine this? Yeah. My path is kind of interesting because as a martial arts coach, uh, I've been through a couple cycles of this where we uh, gathered a curriculum and then we solidified it, became a tradition. And then the art died in place. And that was the end of it. 
and it, 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 it made a very narrow window for people who would actually train in it. Uh, when the UFC came along, it shook everybody's pillars. We had to reorganize. And one thing we know is we have to have a living curriculum. We have to have a living body of knowledge that we're constantly refining. Uh, I'm very fortunate because like most really successful instructors, my wife is a part of my business and she allows that to bridge the gap. Uh, so I get a lot more women in my class than I would by myself as, uh, as, as, as the robust former fighter I am, you know, that she, she bridges that gap for me. So I get a lot of people and it's just basically the armed citizen that I'm interested in, but I also get the gateway because I teach, teach her proactive mindset course, which allows them to come into it. Uh, we, that's their first introduction. It's very easy of uh, just, uh, uh, simple things they can do in their life, regular, like sort of like what Chris does with his curriculum. Uh, then we have pepper spray. Uh, we have the image-based decisional drills, which allows them to recognize the flaws and the patterns of uh, desired protection that they wanted. And then we work all the way through to the armed citizen. And sometimes that's force on force training for me. That's primarily what I was as a force on force instructor because teaching people to fight. But now I've ended up being a pistol instructor because I know how to talk to people first and to reach the new potential clients out there, it requires a different sort of uh, philosophy and motivation that I put the emphasis on reaching them, connecting with them, and getting them started and being a mentor along the way. What I like to always say uh, is, you know, I don't call my, myself a, 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 a stru- an instructor so, to, so much as I am somebody who is their advocate. And I'm advocating for their success always, whatever that success may be. I don't determine it, but if they just want to live a little safer or they want to learn to use their pepper spray, they want to learn a little martial arts, they want to learn firearms. And it changes over time as it did for all of us. So this advocacy spreads over years into decades, sometimes with my students. And it's really interesting to be able to be a part of that process and to find that, that group. Now I get a lot of high level shooters too, because they're very interested in the mental side of this, which I think is a very under taught or appreciated or not even that. I don't think most people know how to access it um, because they don't understand number one, the science behind it. And number two, for me, I was, te- I was training fighters at a professional level and imagine taking somebody you care about pretty deeply and you spend a lot of time with them and uh, you throw them in a ring with another person. If you don't understand how that person works and how to motivate them in the proper way and to get the highest performance level out of them, uh, you get to watch them beat to a pulp in front of your very eyes. And the responsibility in that was tremendous. So it's given me a big insight on how to get to this, this place. And it allows me to reach a broad range of people because, you know, 40 years of instruction uh, gives me a, a, a a big advantage. But I think really the thing for me is the armed citizen fighting from concealment with whatever tools would create a completeness for them and let them be safe at the end of the day. That's awesome. Chris. Yeah. So I, and I still do, uh, I still do some contract consulting with the department of defense, my own yeah. my work for primarily. Uh, and even then I'm basically falling in on a program of instruction that's pre-existing. But as far as my, my, my freelance work where I get to decide who I teach and how I teach them, I'm primarily uh, dealing with uh, civilians, armed citizens. And how I determine um, how, like, who is my, who is my key demographic? I, I took a look at it, you know, a couple of years before I retired, I started looking at ultimately qualifications and needs. Uh, so the first thing I have to ask is what am I qualified to to teach? What am I qualified to help people with? What are my strengths? Uh, So where can I fit in? And then who can I help? And and then needs, what's missing? Uh, Because frankly, you know, I think we all know you can't, you know, after 20 years of warfare, you can't swing a dead cat without finding a soft guy that teaches a technical carving class. And and I will be debuting a technical carving class next year, Uh, but I don't want to (laughs) just do that. And so what, what's missing, I think, again, is, is there's, if you want to learn how to, uh, uh, shoot fast, don't suck, uh, you know, be precise and, and quick. There's a lot of great instructors out there uh, to include a couple of, a couple other instructors on this panel. Uh, and so, so I've tried to emphasize the mental game specifically that I'm qualified to teach it, taught it for a number of years, um, planning, mental agility, 
uh, how to choose uh, from the, the toolbox what tools that I'm going to have, both physical and uh, cognitive, that I'm going to bring with me as I go about my day-to-day, and how to communicate that to people. And fortunately, because I was uh, spent my career as a, as a Green Beret teaching people in different languages and uh, having to be real creative and efficient in our training techniques, because my, my Arabic's decent, but it's not that good, uh, and having to really wrestle with how I can communicate complex concepts in a simple and efficient way. Uh, it's helped me to, uh, now that I get to teach uh, in my, my native language, it's helped me to be efficient in my communications and help people who've probably not thought about a lot of the contextual um, concerns with, with self-preservation uh, and communicate that to them efficiently in a short period of time. And so, yeah, ultimately for me, it comes down to what am I qualified to teach and what's needed. And, and so I, I chose to emphasize um, more initially out the gate uh, cognitive tasks because I felt that that's something that we haven't done a whole lot of uh, in the training, training industry, frankly, because people just want to get out on the range and, and you know, turn, turn bullets into They into do. Work. Yeah, which is fun stuff. It's a good time. <laughs> I think one of the biggest problems with that, though, is it is a good time. Maybe it's too good of a time. And people are confusing that with something that could be actually ultimately beneficial. We can use that same exact ammo and apply it to something that's actually beneficial. Unfortunately, though, typically that is going to be a task that isn't going to be as fun. So, and, and I, uh, I, I, I jokingly call myself a, a purveyor of fine vegetables uh, because frankly, the most, uh, I, I'm trying to get people to eat their vegetables is what I'm trying to do. Uh, <laughs> the most lucrative thing I could probably do if I just wanted to make a whole lot of money and get my name out there would be start up an Instagram where I do all my videos shirtless with a plate carrier on and a light coat of oil. And, uh, you know, and I basically affect this like WWE persona <laughs> and run around theatrically and I grab insurance sales and housewives and I put them through a shop house and I run tactical fantasy. Camp, right? and that's fun. You wrong. can do that. Yeah. As long as, as long as tactical fantasy camp is safe, I don't have any problem with it. If you want to pay a thousand bucks or whatever to go do a shoot house for a weekend, mm-hmm. because it's just fun. Awesome. However, um, that's just not really where my passion lies. My passion yeah. lies actually helping people get safer. And the insurance salesman from Omaha doing multi-team, multi-room, multi-level clearances isn't super helpful. Uh, so I'm trying to convince people to kind of do the hard stuff, the, the nug work, thinking through and solving problems mentally uh, that's oftentimes not as exciting uh, unless you're a nerd like myself. Uh, and, and, you know, may that hurt the bottom line? Sure. But frankly, I'm okay with it. But again, ultimately, yeah, I'm trying to get people to eat their vegetables. Um, yeah. And, and that, that takes a great deal of communication on my part to cast that vision of why you want to show up and do this instead of going and doing the, 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 uh, the room clearing and repelling and all that kind of stuff. Man, I identify with that entirely. With the way primary and secondary has been, we've been focused on, you know what? We're going to focus on the good stuff. And we don't need the flashy, ignore the wall. Uh, we don't need the... You don't need all the flashy and all that, all that kind of stuff, but uh, it's, it's all about the good information and ultimately what is going to change people's mind for the, for the better, good experience, good instruction, good insights. Uh, I was talking to Tessa about a a certain Mr. Chuck Haggard and how that dude, man, that dude is just awesome. And he is such a positive, positive influence. If we could have a million of those guys posting on Instagram, I think the world would be a better place. And I, I would hope that people would uh, take that seriously, but no. Yeah. Tessa. I don't know. Sometimes eating your vegetables, well, always eating your vegetables leads to a healthier lifestyle. And I like personally, like shooting is not something that I got into as a hobby. It wasn't something that I enjoyed doing. Um, that was my husband's thing. And I got into concealed carry entirely what felt like out of necessity. And I, I really didn't, I didn't like, I didn't like the vegetables part until I saw the results from it. Yeah. And then that's, that's when shooting got fun for me. It went from, okay, I have to do this because if I'm going to carry a gun, I should do it well. And then I started actually seeing the results from eating my vegetables and then it, then it clicked. I was like, Oh, this is why people enjoy this. So yeah, vegetables are good. Good vegetables, Chris. (laughs) Um, so my demographic is really super duper easy. Um, concealed carry is my thing and, um, concealment specifically is something I feel, um, fairly confident talking about. And so 
I, I cover that a lot, um, on my YouTube channel and on my Instagram and beyond that, the purpose of my, you know, social media presence is to, um, essentially I'm a beginner. And so my goal is to kind of document that process, um, to kind of articulate to the other beginners out there. Um, this is kind of what the process can look like. And, um, this is, you know, this is the kind of work that I'm putting in. Um, you can do that too. And, you know, this is, this is a doable process, um, back to, you know, vegetables are good and kind of talk about also the downfalls of, uh, a lot of the bad concealed carry practices and whatnot mm -hmm. that are out there. So I try to address those as well. So my, my demographic is really, um, uh, the beginner concealed carrier. You know, there is so much truth to what you just said also about when you were getting those positive results, because I've, I've, I've been there and I, and I figured out, Holy crap, this, this works. What I was just taught, I applied it. It works. I, I thought I enjoyed shooting. Oh no. Now I, and having that purpose adds so much more meaning. So, and again, yeah, more purpose, but so much more focus and it became, it became so much more valuable to me mm. and opposite of what we were talking with Chris about with, we were just turning ammo into noise, actually having that going to classes to learn and realizing, you know what, this is going to be so much more beneficial for me. And if I can turn around and take some of this stuff and apply it to other aspects of my life, or if I can uh, use this and help out some buddies, man, that's a huge bonus. But yeah, to, to, to see those results is wonderful. It is, it's life-changing. Well, and for the beginner like myself, you know, after going, we, a lot of us just came back from uh, the ASP national conference. And after coming back from something like that, um, and having like getting to spend time with all different instructors and hear from a bunch of different perspectives, I get to come back from a weekend like that and go to the range. And I have so much to pick and choose from to work on. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to the range aimless, which is the worst yes, it going is. there, not knowing what to do, especially as a beginner and by myself, um, being able to be able to go to a weekend like that and hear from different perspectives. And it's, it's really encouraging. And if I can use the word empowering to it go is. to the range, um, and have, have specific things that I know that I need to work on. I think the worst thing about that or the worst, something that would be worse than a beginner going off and just turning ammo to noise is that person that thinks they're a veteran or experienced and they're at a novice level. And, but, it, and this is one of those messages all of us have tried to convey, look, go take a class. It, it, it has a, it has a great potential of changing your whole outlook of all of this stuff. And it's really cool to see the people that take that to heart. They take the class and they go, holy crap, that's, I, I'm changing my, my, my direction. Now I'm now focusing. I'm now, I'm going to train with that Riley dude. And then shoot really, really fast and wear camo hats. Okay, Riley, I guess you can talk now. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I want to say something based on what something Tessa said. And you referred to, yours, to yourself as a beginner. And I, I don't know how exactly you arrived at the conclusion that you're still just a beginner. Uh, what metric you're using or criteria you're using to uh, make that, that judgment. But, uh, let's get, let's first clarify that how long you've been doing stuff is not the, cl the qualifier for whether you're a beginner or not, because we all know those dudes that have been doing stuff for 40 years, but as Matt just said, they're still a novice. Um, you can be doing something a relatively short amount of time, but because of the dedication to this, whatever you call it whether it's a practice or a, a new, I don't know, a job. I don't know. It's not really a job for you. I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe you're making tolling off of Instagram and YouTube. I don't know. But um, 
point is, is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, I could tell that you're someone that's working really hard at what you're doing and you can make huge growth in advance, um, by just applying yourself. So, uh, don't sell yourself short, but, um, also remain humble and keep working at it. I would try, I'm not too worried about with you. Um, but anyway, so my audience, uh, I'm going to approach this from the two sides that I primarily work on and or work in now, uh, with concealedcarry.com and the concealed carry podcast. Our goal is to primarily reach people are just getting into the pipeline with concealed carry. And that happens in a lot of different ways. You have the people that are brand spanking new, like they've never even touched a gun and, you know, their neighbor got robbed last month or the, the riots in the streets last year inspired them to go buy a gun and hopefully get some training or whatever. And so they're, they're just, they are totally fresh on the flip side. We also get, and this would be my goal too, is to reach those veterans or police officers that, you know, from 20, 30 years ago that maybe feel like they know a thing or two, but it's been a while. And the training they might've gotten was either not as deep as what they thought it was, or it was completely irrelevant for the modern times. So, um, and we see all kinds across the spectrum that come through our doors figuratively and also somewhat literally, but, uh, that's, that's, that's our goal is to try to communicate to people that are on more of the beginner side of the spectrum to help guide their journey, uh, give them the best information we can and, uh, help them to avoid making mistakes. Cause a lot of us, if a lot of us, if not all of us here at some point have made probably all of us have made mistakes <laughs> at some point <laughs> relative to carrying a gun or carrying concealed. So, uh, we want to try to help avoid those pitfalls. So that's, that's my one audience on the, on the uh, direct instruction side of things, or as Brian likes to consistently refer to coaching side of things, which I am really <laughs> appreciative of. Um, I'm, I'm more geared towards reaching people that have a base of fundamental skill. Although I work with shooters of all skill levels and have, um, but I'm more interested in reaching those that are ready to take that next step. Um, so as long as they've got some, basic fundamental level skill, like I said, then I, I, I believe I can help show them that those next steps and avoid the, the years of pain and struggle, uh, and plateau after plateau after plateau. And so, uh, and, and ideally I, I really am passionate about reaching those that are very serious about carrying a gun for personal defense, uh, including cops, uh, I look at one of the core, one of the core concepts of my curriculum is shot calling, but to be able to shot call, well, we need to get that visual processing piece of things figured out. And so that's kind of the natural progression. Of my, my curriculum is set people through the mental, emotional, and then visual components of shooting. And that gets us to a place where we can call shots a lot more effectively and hopefully call shots at a high rate of speed which I believe is directly applicable to anybody that might need to use a gun, a handgun in, uh, in personal defense of any kind. And I'm super passionate about wanting to reach more police officers because man, they need stuff like that. Like how much better would it be to think you're getting your hits on a target versus know you're getting hits on your target. Uh, and so that's, that's what I'm, what I'm shooting for. So on the teaching side of things, I'm more focused on a more intermediate level, but on the, on the day job and the day, day to day communication side of things is more of the beginner level. And ultimately a perfect world to be people come in the door, the beginner level, and we help them advance. And then hopefully they're ready to take my live in-person instruction shortly down the road. You know, it's, it's interesting what you said to Tessa about um, beginners and things like that. I remember a conversation with Tim Heron finding out, and this was a couple of years ago, finding out he'd only been shooting for five years. What? Yeah. It's amazing what a little bit of focus and dedication can do. And that guy's a awesome shooter. 
very, very skilled, accomplished, and has a wonderful understanding. But he didn't drink milk, at least not enough milk. <laughs> so short that joke. Th that's a short joke. Yes. <laughs> um, so I got two topics right now. They're kind of going in opposite directions. Not sure which one, but they're both related. Um, I remember early on as an instructor trying to eat up all the information as possible on the topic, on the topics that I'd be teaching. And then I found out it would basically be uh, information vomit, trying to, trying to distill everything out. And that, that didn't work out very well. I was all over the place trying to teach. How do you guys distill those messages to, to finer points and to focus on what is important to your classes? Riley? Mm. It's a good question, uh, actually. So, you know, I, I, if I'm thinking on like where I think the greatest pitfall for me to like to fall into that same type of trap as an instructor is in some of the concealed carry classes that I've taught through the years. And it's, especially as you become more and more experienced yourself, there's definitely that tendency to be like, I have so much I could give you like, here you go. But I always have to put myself back in the position of like, I'm sitting in that chair or I'm the one that's sitting in this class. And I mean, I was there once upon a time too. So hopefully I can remember what that was like. And that, that's how I, that's how I approach it is try to just put myself in back in that, in that seat in a class of, Hey, I don't need to know about who knows all kinds of things, right? You know, I don't need to know about shot calling when I'm just getting started. I'm just in a concealed carry class. I need to learn how I need to learn some basics about, um, about the laws. I need to learn about carrying a gun and doing so safely. I need to learn about firearm safety. You know, we don't have to go down this windy path of, you know, enlightenment. We just got to get them the basics. So, um, yeah, I ask myself that question a lot is when I was in this position, how would I need to be fed that information? And that, that's something I think some instructors lose sight of is, is forgetting where they once were themselves. Or sometimes people honestly kind of, some people are just fortunate and maybe they shortcutted some things that maybe for other people they struggle with and they might not have that perspective of what it was like to be on the ground floor. And so, uh, you know, in that case, it's good to expose yourself to more, you know, more frames of reference, if you will. Um, that's where it's helpful to go and study from other instructors and see what they're doing and maybe ask the questions. Well, why is he presenting it this way versus, you know, this is how I would do it. And well, there's a probably a valid reason why an, another experienced instructor is teaching it that way, because, you know, maybe you didn't have that, that experience yourself and, and you don't know how to reach some of those people. So um, it's all about like, we all need to broaden our, our experience where we can and expose ourselves to other ways of thinking and techniques and teaching methodologies. And, and then try, and constantly ask ourselves, like, what does the student need? What does the student need to hear? Cause it's all about, at the end of the day, it's all about the student, not, not about making ourselves feel good about how much stuff we can spew. So it's all about helping them, the student. Cool. That's kind of cool the way you just described that, because that kind of covers that next topic that we'll get, get to in a minute. Um, Tessa, when you're creating your content, how do you maintain that focus on a specific topic and not go off on the ballistic coefficient of whatever and ARs and residential buildings and. Uh, that's really easy. I don't know about those other things. <laughs> wait, wait, you, you stay in your lane. It's really easy when you don't really know what the Concept. other lanes are. Um, no. So I, I don't know that this is something I do as much, at least I don't necessarily focus on that as much with Armin styled but I also work for Filster. So I am their director of customer development. 
And I've only been uh, working for them for a little over a month and a half, maybe two months now. Um, and something that I've been working on specifically over those two months is um, finding a way to communicate how, you know, people use the Enigma to the absolute beginner. Like um, they have a whole new set of customers that are uh, buying the Enigma and they've never, they haven't even bought their first gun yet. Mm. Um, so we're, they're trying to learn the nuances of concealment before they've even bought their gun they're going to carry. Um, so, so my job has been to really simplify, um, the enigma and pick out the core pieces that are important for people to know prior to purchasing and afterwards. Um, so, and, and that's, that's fairly simple to do. Um, I'm, I'm just niching down on those really important pieces. Like how, cool. how am I going to put this together? Um, where, where should I be putting it on my body? Um, for it to conceal best. Um, and then really with armed and styled, I, again, staying, staying in my niche and um, catering to that specific demographic is really simple for me because I am, I'm, I'm, I'm new to concealed carry in terms of time. Yes. Um, and, you know, I've been focusing on it and learning fairly quickly um, but my goal is to communicate to that beginner. So it's, it's fairly simple for me to stay there. If that makes sense. It does, but believe it or not, and I'm sure you've already seen it. Yeah. There are those people though, that are clueless in pretty much everything, but they still decide to comment or give advice. Well, and let, let me, be, let me be real here. Like I've had my moments, you know, where I'll, you know, make a comment. That's not, that's not my lane, you know? And I'll just, I'll step outside of it. Um, but especially when I was just getting started. Um, yeah. When I was just getting started with concealment, I thought I knew about it. Um, and then I really started to learn more, more about it and realized how much I didn't know. So we all have our moments, I'm sure. So when you posted about discussing organizational structures of high tempo direct action teams and the shortfalls of over special, special specialization, <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah. Inside joke from a text between all of us. She wasn't sure what we were going to discuss. And that's what I said it was going to be. Yeah. Great. Chris. Yeah. So, uh, I actually have a lot of, uh, a lot of thoughts on this, this exact subject because, uh, the, the art and science of, of teaching and breaking down complex concepts into simple, uh, bite-sized concepts, eating the elephant one bite at a time is, uh, I think one of the greatest challenges that we have. Uh, so right before I retired, I was teaching an advanced skills course, which was four and a half months long. Um, and even though I was teaching, really high performing special operators. It was kind of a different, different subject matter than what they've been exposed to in the past. And one of the tough things, one of the challenges that I had as an instructor, and this isn't because I'm awesome, I just basically I'd had a lot of experience in that particular skill set. And whenever you have a high degree of immersion in a discipline, and then you're dealing with someone who has no exposure to that discipline, uh, the amount of information that you take for granted, where I would be having a conversation with a student and I would reference something, and then they would look at me when I use a particular term, like I had two heads, and I would be like, oh, wait, you don't learn that for another two weeks. And so uh, I think one of the keys to uh, curriculum development and communicating that curriculum is empathy. And I really, frankly, think empathy is one of the keys to life. But being able to put yourself in that student's mind, uh, mindset and see your material as the student will see it. Uh, I've got to give a shout out to John Korea from Active Self-Protection because every, every year when he does his conference, he starts off the conference with uh, there's like the instructor brief. And then we do just a short little like, uh, you know, there, there's a drill that we all he, he creates that we're all going to shoot and compete against one another. And part of the reason he does it is because it's fun. And the other part of the reason he does it is to remind you, uh, basically he throws a drill at you that most people haven't seen before. Uh, the, the one that we did this year, R Riley, Brian, and myself all competed against one another. Um, and uh, it turns out Riley's better at math uh, than Brian and I. And, and Riley, Riley took, uh, yeah, took home first place. Um, and Brian outshot me as well. But uh, the, the point of it was basically, hey, guys, tomorrow we're going to have a lot of 
very relatively novice shooters show up and I want to put you guys on a drill that, you know, there's he built in, you know, math, basically a casino drill and the advanced super test and John Johnson's uh, dot assessment madness all had a baby. It would have been this drill. And <laughs> I want to make you feel, they say, I want to make you feel what the student's going to feel when he's getting a bunch of range commands and having to think about, uh, you know, he's walking and chewing gum at the same time. So I think uh, one of the keys to this frankly, for instructors is to be lifelong learners and continue to be students, specifically studying disciplines that make you uncomfortable and overwhelmed. Because it's one thing for me to go and like, if I go take, you know, one of Brian's pistol class, I'm going to learn a ton. And I'm already a fairly capable pistol shooter. Uh, however, if I go to a pottery class, I'm going to be the worst student in the class. And I, I try to sometimes seek those opportunities out specifically so that I can put myself in the headspace of somebody who doesn't, I don't know what ballpark I'm in. I don't know what sport I'm playing. And I think that forcing yourself to do that as an instructor is really, really healthy. And then beyond that, the, uh, the, the last thing I'll say about it is that I think that you ultimately have to build a straw man. And that straw man, you can do it a couple of different ways, but that straw man is going to be, or straw woman, straw person, uh, to remain inclusive. That straw man needs to be, you, you can create a straw man of like the perfect self-defender, self-protector, uh, or you can make several straw men. What is my, what is my novice graduate look like? What can the person who's basically ready to start carrying a handgun day to day safely and effectively, what are the critical tasks that they can accomplish? What we call in the military a critical task list. We create that critical task list and then we start basically reverse engineering. This is the straw man of what I want this person to be at the end of this class or at the end of the series of classes and then start reverse engineering and breaking it down into its smaller parts. Uh, because yeah, you can't take somebody uh, from where Tim Heron was, you know, five years ago to where Tom, Tim Heron is now in a weekend, you got to figure out, okay, where do we need to start and prioritize, you know, and I prioritize with like safety, legal use of force and figure out what's most important. If you've got 15 minutes with a student, what do you want to teach them? And it should inform that straw man concept, which is just a reverse planning concept that I obviously picked up in the military. So practically th those are my thoughts. It's cool because you also touched upon the next two questions. Without even thinking, that's awesome. And it tells me I'm on the right track. Brian? Hey, what a great panel. <laughs> this is really awesome. All right, so a couple of things. Uh, as, uh, uh, first, I am a deconstructionist at heart. Uh, I tear things apart. I put them back together. It's been my nature my whole life. Uh, I'm also a truth seeker, and I don't have any particular attachment to any particular one truth. Uh, because basically I change my opinion about every three weeks, because otherwise you're a really stubborn person if you don't, and you're not letting new information in. If I'm going to build a curriculum, I'm going to use the Pareto principle. I'm going to find the 20% inputs that give me the out 80% of success. And then I'm going to start marking things off my list. I use the rule of threes to teach from. So I'm constantly looking for a pattern of three because it's the minimum amount. Uh, my goal with an armed citizen would to identify the three most common things they need to have. Thankfully for John's work at Active Self-Protection, he's made that pretty easy uh, where we can watch 30, 35,000 videos of horrible things happening to people, which I got to tell you guys, you know, in the 80s, we had no idea uh, what a fight looked like, how it started or how to prepare for it. And basically everything I did in martial arts was useless. Hmm. I mean, it's the God's honest truth. It just didn't work. So, you know, for me, like for the armed citizen, there's three things that I want to do. I want them to know when, when to decide to use force and the appropriate amount. I think that's the first thing, because that's really difficult to do. Uh, they have to have a very efficient uh, draw stroke that is not only probable, but possible. And they need to efficiently hit the target. Everything else starts to fall away after that when we watch John's videos. So that gives me a real clear way to teach from it. And then I try to falsify my hypothesis by watching other things, seeking other in information, citing at least five sources instead of three, because you can get three people to agree on anything. But when you get to the fifth one, you usually get some sort of uh, reflection of something going astray. And it allows you to build a curriculum that can speak to people. Uh, I think instructors spend way too much time on technical prowls. Uh, they need to be engaging speakers that energize it because you only have about one minute to catch a person at the beginning of your class. Otherwise, they're gone. Uh, and then you're fighting uphill and they've decided that they're not as interested as they were. You also need to be very competent, but in a general way. So say you're a pistol instructor, it's not enough to be competent on the Glock now. 
You need to be competent on a CZ because you need to understand the double action, single action. You need to understand 1911s. You need to understand somebody who's big, somebody who's small, different body types, physiology that goes along with that, and how we can maximize it. And then the most important thing for an instructor is he has to have a very high EQ or she has to have an high EQ because she has to manage people. Because if you're teaching people, the key to it is the arousal level. I know it's a funny term, but it's a psychological term. And what we have to do is keep people, the challenge and the skill sets on par with their arousal level. And the data is about 4% about above what they can do. If I do too little, I lose them and they say, I've got this. If I do too much, I overwhelm them. And this is a very unique skill to be able to do that with people. It means you have to read people. So as Chris was saying about empathy, you have to be able to place yourself inside of that person and let your ego go about what you think is important. And then my curriculum is subjected to the clinician test. I'm going to teach as a clinician. If it doesn't work and I don't see the results I want, I'm going to change. And if I don't get results in three inputs, I'm going to change what I'm doing with that person and look for a different result immediately because good coaches change people right this second. This garbage that Malcolm Gladwell put out about 10,000 hours. I wish we would quit talking about it because it's not how people work. He stole it. It was for 18 year old cellist and most of them quit anyway. Uh, and it doesn't make a master to do anything for 10,000 hours. I've been doing it for 100,000 hours. Uh, the insight that I have now is, is incredible. But the changes that I made as a student came almost instantaneously when somebody connected with me and became a support system for what I was doing. And we became a team. And if you think about the greatest teacher you've ever had or the greatest coach you've ever had, how did it feel? They found a way to connect with you, to support you, and to communicate with you in a way that allowed your, you to see yourself in a way that you'd never seen before. And therefore, you had to face your own truth and overcome it in the moment and find success. And I'll tell you what, success breeds success, and it always will. And this idea that we have to be flogged into success is just ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you can tell I get passionate about this, but I believe that we teach in a very archaic, incestuous manner, because we just keep passing it along. And even though it's not working, we're loath to let it go because everybody else is doing it. And uh, it, it, if it doesn't work, it needs to be changed and it can be changed. And people are really easy to get on board with that program. And I just, uh, you know, if you build a curriculum, don't let it trap you either. That's the other side. Curriculums trap people forever. I'm this guy of specificity. We're joking about it, but it is a trap in the long run. And one of the hard things for, for people with me is they can't ever figure out what I do. You know, the martial arts guys think I'm shooters. The shooters think I'm a martial arts guy. The knife guys think I'm a jujitsu guy, but I'm a generalist because I, I'll, I'll finish on this thought. I, I know Force Science has done a little bit with this too. There's, there's different ways that we focus. We have an internal and external focus. Uh, we have a narrow and a broad focus. If you are a student or a competitor, your focus is internal and narrow. It's to improve yourself and nothing else. And that's why we see high-level competitors are not especially good teachers. Coaches have an external narrow focus on you. So I spend most of my time in practice, practicing how I'm going to say something, practicing how I'm going to teach it, and writing notes constantly to refine it so that I can make it simpler for somebody each time I present it. And if you'll do that as a coach and practice it, you'll have immaculate timelines. You'll be able to fit all your material in and you won't feel like you're over teaching to people and people, they, they, they dig it man. they just love to be able to do something right now instead of six weeks from now. And it doesn't mean you don't have to work hard. I'm not saying that in any way, but you know, the intrinsic drivers of passion and curiosity and autonomy, where it's your idea and mastery come from this idea where you can take over your training and I simply become the support system. And I would like you to feel like I really didn't have anything to do with it. Somehow it all happened. You know, you may remember fondly that we had a good time and everything got better, but somehow you mastered this, this and it was your responsibility, your idea. You know, it's really sad because pretty much everything you just said goes against 
law enforcement firearms training. That's why it I get is, kicked out every group I'm in. <laughs> it is so sad, but uh, so many agencies are trapped and it's incestuous and it's, it's just, it's sad. Yeah. Um, that was can, I, awesome. can I just say that listening to Brian uh, go off on all that has got me aroused. Four <laughs> percent, brother. Four <laughs> percent. I don't think it's only four percent. But dude, dude, uh, I was, I was loving everything that you said. Yeah, thank you. So well, we all worked yeah. together this weekend, right? Yes, you, you know, guys did. Yeah. yeah, and we, we, you know, man, I loved AIing for you, and I loved taking Chris's class last year. And there's, this is the first time where I see some. Uh, real harmony among curriculums where people are starting to teach the things that are essential. I think it's really cool. So I've used this example multiple times. I recently had it in a phone conversation. Um, basically it's the idea of how to stay grounded. I had a conversation with Bill Blowers a few years ago talking about what are we going to do for videos? Well, uh, we're, we're, we're running out of ideas here. What are we going to do for these, these short little videos? And I said, you know, take it down, take it down to a basic level. Talk about those things that we take for granted. We've been doing this stuff for years and we don't even think of the orientation of our mags. We don't think of a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why not talk about that? Chris talked about it a little. Um, how do you guys stay grounded? Because we can, we can attempt to empathize but is there anything beyond that that you can do to stay in touch and to focus on what the, what the more novice people are thinking for me, one of my secrets, and I don't talk about this very much, but it's going on to Facebook into low information groups and figure out what people are talking about and determine that's my topic that I'm going to be talking about, or this is the topic that needs to be addressed, or this is what I'm going to write an article about or make a video about. Um, that's my way to, to tap in on what, what a lot of basic end users are worried about or in the dark about Chris. Yeah. Well, I, I already, uh, already touched on it a little bit as far yeah. as my, I, I try to go out and learn things that I'm absolutely terrible, uh, terrible at. And, uh, you know, for example, I'm a, I'm a big, big, uh, big heavy guy. You know, lift a lot of weight off the ground, but uh, gymnastically, I'm terrible. So anytime I need some humility, I'll try to like do a handstand or, you know, some CrossFit gymnastics type stuff. Um, the uh, it's it's interesting you bring up the the, the internet's uh, and going into low information uh, Facebook groups, of which there is no shortage. Um, but I, I find myself, and, I, and likewise, I try to I try to go out and, and engage with people out and you know, uh, gin pop we call it, and you'll run into uh, consistently people who will oftentimes make low information assertions that are so it's like, it's like talking to a flat earther or somebody will bring something up. And, uh, I try very hard tangentially. I try very hard to be an, uh, an anti troll online. And I try to interact with everybody online with the same degree of manners and decorum that I would in person. And so the, the, the immediate instinct is just to clown somebody, but you know, and, and just like say, you know, say something very dismissive to them. But then when you stop yourself, like you're talking about and say, okay, this person believes that turning on a white light inside of their home will give away their position. And so, uh, so they're just going to like start firing at shapes in the dark and I can call them an idiot, but that's going to shut them off and they may one day shoot a family member. So how can I, uh, how can I, um, how can I reach them? And suddenly when you, when you, you're, there's this huge expanse that you're trying to address. Uh, it, it forces you to, to really reconsider uh, all the things that you think are self-evident because they're not. So I think, yeah, I think uh, uh, getting in gin pop groups on Facebook is a really good one. Uh, and I think, I think the big one too is, is uh, just taking as much training as possible uh, within the industry. Uh, I, I would sign up. I'll, I can tell you right now, uh, like if, if uh, Tessa was teaching something, uh, whatever it was, I'd sign up. And you know why I'd sign up? Because I want to hear how she explains it. It's just because she's been doing it for six months and I've been doing it for 16 years doesn't mean she doesn't have a better way to, to, to skin that cat. And so uh, I think the big thing is just maintaining an attitude of humility uh, and always looking for a better way to build a mousetrap. And a lot of that's going to come from, like I said, putting yourself out there, making yourself vulnerable, making yourself a lifelong learner and a lifelong student. It's funny that you just used the term flat earther. In the morning... <laughs> Part of my routine, 
Facebook, go to memories, read them. Three years ago today, I posted, and this is a quote, this morning I got a message from a flat earther. I think he was offended by being associated with open carry. <laughs> yeah. Tessa. Um, Facebook groups are another one for me too. And uh, actually Sarah Houtman turned me on to that idea. Uh, I was, you know, I avoided those groups because they really frustrate me. Like yep. they just, they, they push my buttons and Chris, you do a great job online of not letting those buttons be pressed. Um, and, and people like you and Sarah does an amazing job at that. And it's, it's, it's encouraging for me and it, and it helps me to stay in that way. Um, but yeah, being in those Facebook groups is really helpful. It's something I've um, made an effort to do more of. And, and through that making, sorry, I'm looking, I made notes to myself, so I didn't do what I'm doing right now. Um, yeah. So out, outside of just those Facebook groups, which I think is a great resource for really anyone looking to teach on anything, like I'm in a jujitsu group as well. And you know, an, a black belt could be in there and he could be learning about, um, the way that the one stripe white belt heard what their black belt was teaching them. And he could think, okay, I'm going to explain that differently because they didn't receive that instruction the way that it was intended to be received. Um, and then, sorry, taking my notes again, knew what this okay. guy's, um, oh, so I, again, I still do consider myself a beginner and I'm still learning things all of the time as, as everyone is, but whenever I learn something new, I do present that to my audience. If it's something that, um, I, I know is true. So for example, a couple of months ago, um, Amy Langdon asked, you know, what is this blue stuff around the primer on this defensive ammunition? And I had just had that conversation with my husband a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, Oh, that's a sealant. You know, like I knew the answer to that, but I would never think to like post that on my Instagram. Like, Hey guys, this blue stuff, that's a sealant. <laughs> so I, when I learn even basic stuff like that, I share that on the internet and it often is met with, I had no idea. Like I had no idea that that was a thing. Um, so, and, and that's why a lot of the times I, again, I do refer to myself as a beginner because as I am learning really, really basic stuff like that, I can share that with my audience um, that is primarily beginners and they can receive that information alongside me. How does that blue stuff taste though? Like red? <laughs> <laughs> tastes like purple. It tastes like purple. <laughs> okay, Riley. <laughs> okay. Um, so I actually want to start by just, uh, saying saying something to chris uh going back to a conversation you and i had by the fire saturday night something Very you rare. really yeah, yeah you impressed me another arousing when conversation you, when you uh when you were telling me about when you lived in the pacific northwest and uh, not too far from uh, gabe white and you mentioned how you went and took like all of his like 101 101 a or 102 or what all those different classes from Gabe White. I was like, wow, that's that's really cool because there probably had to have been people in those classes along with you that were like, what is this dude doing in here? <laughs> uh, but I, you know, you told me you said it, you said it in as many words that you know you were there to to learn and see how Gabe was teaching and all this stuff. And I was like, that's really cool, man. That's super cool more of us could benefit from doing things like that. So I just wanted to give you props on that brother. Um, and it's a great example of exactly what we're talking about right here. So uh, several of you have talked about the Facebook groups. Um, I have known several of you from the Facebook groups and got acquainted with you oftentimes before I knew you in real, real life because of Facebook groups. Um, I have used Facebook groups for some time to number one, try to reach people that I felt like could be reached. 
And number two, and this came secondarily, was it, because it is a great exercise to think through what you think you know and think through how to explain it. And usually in the course of that, I'm asking myself, do I really understand what I'm trying to c- convey here? And that is a great mental exercise to, to work through. Um, and reaching other people in environments like that is really challenging because there's a lot of noise and people get offended really easily. And even if you just speak very matter of factly, they're like, who are you? And, you know, to tell me this and like, whatever, dude, you know? And so, um, I, I have worked really hard to communicate with these types of people effectively. And that I think has uh, benefited me greatly. Um, one of the best things I think is just while being empathetic, asking specific questions about their position and not in a, you know, yeah. And you have to word things super carefully to not switch them off by coming across as being, you know, offensive in some way. But, uh, by just, you know, like, well, why do you believe that kind of thing? Or, you know, just getting very specific about, about their points and, and, uh, in a empathetic way, encouraging them to explain their position more. And ultimately that's what comes down to with communication on, on various topics is, is we all need to be able to explain our positions. Uh, I mean, that's a core principle of primary and secondary forums and Facebook groups, uh, because that keeps us focused on the discussion and evaluating positions. And, you know, that, that helps us grow, helps us learn from one another the best. That's hard to do in gen pop groups, but I have found when we are patient with that, it overall works. Uh, so, I mean, Matt, you, you've seen, and, and Tessa, you've been a part of that to some degree, I think, but you know, we've, we've, quite literally change the the culture of one of those groups from a complete mess yep. <laughs> to where it's, it's, it's very opposite of what, where, what, it, what it once was. So, um, and I try to do that everywhere, wherever, where I go. So that's been a really great uh, exercise. Number two is one of the reasons why I don't teach them very often anymore, but I still do teach some basic concealed carry type classes because that keeps me grounded as well. And just reminding me of kind of where I came from and where most people start. And that's a, that's a great thing to stay grounded. And the third thing is just finding opportunities to be humbled yourself. So as others have mentioned, learning new skills, uh, taking classes and disciplines you're unfamiliar with, or sometimes going to, like I'm going to do in a couple of weeks, like national championships where I'm going to get trounced upon by world champion shooters. And I'm going to go, okay, people say nice things to me and how awesome I am at shooting, but I'm going to go find out that I am still pretty far down the list in the, uh, in terms of the, the rest of the world. So, and that's a, that's a good thing to experience every once in a while. So if I can piggyback on top of that real quick, uh, because you just, Right, I just hit on something that is uh, really, in terms of human performance, and I think this this crosses boundaries of applied violence and anything else. Um, so I think one of the keys to lifelong performance is that we all, one, we have to be honest with ourselves, but two, we have to be able to metaphorically pat ourselves on the back or slap ourselves in the face in equal measure and at the appropriate times. So there are, there are times. So if I, if I, all I ever do is go to my public, public indoor gun range, the local gun shop and shoot there and look to my left and right, then I'm going to start feeling pretty confident in my ability, but it's going to be some hollow confidence. But if all I ever do is go out and shoot with my betters uh, and just get destroyed by guys like, like you and Brian and Gabe White and John Johnston, then I'm going to have low, I'm going to develop low self-esteem and like think that I suck when in reality, I'm, you know, I'm, passable, fair to Midland. So you've got to be able to push yourself and go out and, and seek out opportunities to train with people who are going to humble you. But then before you get too low, go out and shoot at a public gun range, say, yeah, I'm pretty good. 
So being able to pat yourself on the back and slap yourself in the face and appropriate measures to keep yourself even, never too high, never too low, I think over the course of a lifetime of improvement in any given skill is really kind of the, the, uh, the key there. And I, I really like the way that you put it as far as, you know, get, seeking out humility, uh, but don't seek out too much and don't seek out too much confidence either. Cool. <clears throat> Brian? I'll try not to pontificate too much this time. <laughs> Are you sure? Uh, Bring it. Well, yeah, I, I suffer from kleptonesia, which means I remember other people's ideas as my own. So if I don't attribute this appropriately, uh, please. <laughs> and that's <laughs> actually, for... <laughs> that's my next question. <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> well, uh, when I keep myself, uh, you know, at my age, the problem is ossification and calcification. Uh, it's very easy to get good enough and to just rest on your previous accomplishments, on your laurels, and then tell everybody that's just the way it is. And uh, as you age, it gets harder and harder to push yourself, you know, physically, uh, it, it, there's more maintenance than there is progress, you know, mentally, it also there's a, if you don't allow yourself to push, there's a slowing process. And then, you know, it's, it's shrinking if you're not careful. So every month or so, I pick one subject randomly, uh, this month it happened to be quantum physics because it just interests me. Uh, I read three books on it um, or I listen to three audio books. And then I find somebody like my poor wife and I try to explain it to her. Uh, I explain it to a novice. And then I find somebody who has some real skill in it. And I have a real conversation with the bottom uh, about quantum physics or whatever I'm interested in, because if I can explain it to a novice and an expert, it teaches me how to continually learn something new. And uh, it keeps me very fresh and uh, it is equal parts of humility and understanding that at a certain level of mastery, you can see the truths behind things and pick those out very quickly. And if you see the truth clearly enough, you can explain it to somebody who either knows nothing about it or you can talk somewhat intelligently with a master in the field. Um, I use I'm going to steal Craig Douglas's mucking. I, I find it really interesting in our, our field that we don't often use the same thing that we use on criminal actors on ourselves. So I call it managing unknown clients instead of just uh, the other way that, that uh, Craig uses it. And what I do is every time I meet somebody, I start creating a folder of my best guesses about who they are, what they're interested in. I interview them and I get as much intelligence as I can from them. Uh, when I start a class, I walk, watch people walk in to see how their gait is, their confidence level, whether they touch their weapon or not, where they're carrying it, how they dress, what kind of shoes they're wearing. I ask them several very pointed questions that they don't recognize as an interview process. So I really get to know the person and it allows me to teach in a much more streamlined manner than what I want to teach, but how they're going to do it. I watch how they receive information, whether they make eye, hard eye contact, which means they have a strong visual cortex like Riley does. You know, he stares very deeply when he talks to you. But then some of us like myself, I love words and I turn them over. So I point my eyes off to the side so I can savor them and create a vision. And it doesn't mean I'm disrespectful. It means that I'm listening and doing what you're doing. And then some people have to pick everything up and feel it, touch it. And then some people like me can't sit still. They got to move around. So they have to do. If I do all that, I'm so far ahead of the curriculum that all I have to do is fill in information. And then my final thing is uh, John Korea has been nice enough to make me the uh, Manus Dry Fire Monday coach, uh, which means I have a very large audience and I get the most strange comments on YouTube. And my whole goal is to not only turn them from a detractor, but turn them into a supporter. And what I do is I respectfully engage with them. Uh, I explain the position and the, the, what, what I was doing. I ask for their advice. And it's been amazing. I think right now I'm running about 30 or 40% success rate with that. But it allows me to articulate what I'm doing in a better manner to somebody who's newer. And man, you know, one dude was upset because the targets behind my head made me look like Mickey Mouse. But we got into a great conversation about his inability to concentrate and how easily he was distracted. And eventually it led to, what do you think I could do in this situation to concentrate better? You know, so this whole idea of turning somebody from your detractor into your supporter uh, really has to make you pivot. And if you want to be a true 
uh, empathy person, you have to do, be able to do that and put yourself in the other place. So those three things keep me as fresh as I can as a coach. Um, and it, it's, it's an interesting process along the way. And my, my poor wife suffers for a lot of this, <laughs> but you know, I, I'm a different type of personality. I know that I've always been a bit of an outlier and I uh, was barely able to get a high school. Uh, I grew up in a dysfunctional household. My mom was a narcissist. My dad was an undiagnosed sociopath because sociopaths don't go for counseling because they're not feeling real bad about what they're doing, you know, and it allowed me a manipulative side. But what I've done is taken all these ideas of how to get into somebody and see ahead and see danger and start using it also to teach in a more uh, realistic manner and to connect with that person as quickly as I can. I don't recommend going and living with two people like that, of course, but, <laughs> you know, it does help you get ahead of it. And then having some sort of process to keep yourself as fresh as possible. Uh, I just went to primary and secondaries, uh, great conference, you know, and just uh, took three pistol classes and three rifle classes and soaked it up and enjoyed every moment of it and uh, recognized, uh, you know, deficiencies and learned things. And then, of course, stole, I mean, kleptonesia to everybody's curriculum you know, and how they explain things and what they were good at and areas that I thought they'd really improve in. And, uh, you know, I got some great drills from Riley and, uh, it's, it's an interesting process to stay fresh as an instructor. To me, I think this last section is super important for those instructors mm -hmm. who have hit that plateau, because at some point you will get there. If you haven't already, we've all been there, mm -hmm. I'm sure. And we don't see any, any immediate solution. And now we're just, we're now just, we're not making any major strike or ma any major improvements. And the advice given just now, what a great way to get out of that slump and improve and then go to the next level. So I remember Steve Fisher talking about how so many people take an info or taking a lesson plan or something and not giving credit where credit's due. Um, having gone to a bunch of Pat Rogers classes, I was always excited to bring up, Hey, I learned this from Pat Rogers. Check this out. Um, go through Darcy. I learned this through Darcy. Learn this from Rich Mason. Check this out. And then as I went through uh, more and more classes, my, I get, to, I got to drop more names. But for me, it was always exciting, and it was I always felt it was a privilege to be able to bring this up and give credit where credit's due. Is there any special way that you guys do that um, when you're presenting something and you, and you remember, I was influenced by this person? How do you guys honor um, your, your, your initial sources? And this I'll just leave to whoever wants to answer. I have a pretty decent way to do it. Uh, I have an attribution page on my website in case I forget anybody. Uh, so everybody I have trained with that I speak about, I leave the attributions up there so I can at least cite it. Uh, anything I mention in class, uh, I teach from a curriculum in front of me. I try not to wing it unless uh, I, you know, sometimes I get in the flow and everything's there. Uh, but what I try to do is keep the notes fresh in front of me. And if I learn something from somebody, I try to cite them. And uh, usually, most likely, they say somebody else taught it to them. And what I always remind the students of is now, listen, I've given you 20 great instructors to go train with where I got this information so that you can move ahead, too, because you're going to ask me at the end of the class, what's the next step? So you're seeing how, uh, you know, uh, a high level teacher cites sources, attributes people and learns from other. And then I don't have to be responsible for every bit of knowledge in the universe because I can't be, and I don't have to be the, the sole source for that. And if I forget anything, it's sitting on my website and I can say I, I did that. And the funny thing is I've had a lot of instructors come to my class and go, Hey, listen, I really learned this from so-and-so. So they're doing the same thing with me. And then we see the legacy uh, we see where we came from because none of this just jumped out of the air. You know, uh, a lot of the technical things I'm talking about, uh, you know, if we look at Japanese samurai philosophy, it exists inside of that just has different names. You know, warriors have been doing warrior things for a long time and they're and teachers have been teaching for a long time. And I, I'm a big fan of the Stoics. I quote them constantly and I don't think any of them are going to be upset because I didn't cite them, but that's how long knowledge lives. And uh, we're the protectors of knowledge, and we're also the educator of the next generation. 
And we owe it to them to be the role models of what a good instructor and teacher looks like so that they will do the same thing in the future. Awesome. Anyone else? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, so I more or less have the exact same philosophy on it as Brian. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, I think that within the well-respected trainers in the training industry, for lack of a better term to put on it, I think what you're going to, what you're going to find is that's, that's basically kind of the standard, right? Is that if there, there are some concepts that are universally, uh, universally accepted and like, we don't even really know where they started, but generally speaking, if I'm, you know, if I'm quoting Dr. William April, the late great Dr. William April, I'm absolutely in the middle of my class, like in my PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to have his name up there next to that bullet point. And I'm going to make, I'm going to, I'm going to actually pause my class for a second and say, after you leave here, you need to Google Dr. William April Memorial tribute page and go watch everything on it. Uh, and so, yeah, generally speaking, I think that's kind of the standard is making sure we give credit where credit's due and, and not the least of which because, uh, for example, I teach a, I teach a class uh, called uh, MAPS is the acronym, Mental Agility Planning and Preparation Skills. And it's literally an eight-hour classroom seminar uh, that just covers kind of the cognitive processes. You know, we deep dive into recognition, prime decision-making, you know, the OODA cycle, all kinds of stuff that I believe help people uh, become more mentally agile. Uh, but... You know, we touch on like the principles behind Muck, for example. And I'm like, hey, by the way, go train with, you know, Craig Douglas and Chuck Haggard and those guys. And then I, I'll touch on this specific thing. And so somebody can't learn in, an eight, in my eight hour class everything they need to know. But what I can do is highlight where they might be deficient and then guide them to where they can go off and, and, you know, train with this guy who teaches a three or four day class on just that one thing or just something that interests them. Uh, and so you're like, like Brian alluded to, you're providing a roadmap uh, to frankly take our students. Cause I, I take the long-term uh, the, the long-term training health for lack of a better term for my students very seriously. And if I find out that one of my students like takes, takes a couple of classes for me and then like I find out they're in a class with Brian and then they're in a class with Riley and they're, uh, and they're, you know, following, uh, following Tess on uh, you know, Instagram and YouTube uh, that makes me happy. Right. And so if I can point them in the direction of good influences uh, at the end of the day, if somebody's, you know, in med school, and they're, up, they're up all night studying, they're not up all night shooting heroin, right? So I'd rather, I'd rather be out there learning from good instructors than falling into the numerous traps that are out there among the, uh, uh, yeah, the masses. So I don't Ooh. have a lot to add here at all, other than from the student's perspective, um, you know, stepping into this, a, a lot of people, the majority of people, um, getting into guns in general, learn a lot of it from their family member first. And then, you know, if they're lucky, they step into the training world and start taking classes with quality instructors, um, people like Brian, Chris, and Riley. And they, like myself this last weekend, get to hear them tell you where they got the information from. So, you know, these awesome instructors are doing a great job of doing that. But, you know, myself stepping into this, having learned the majority of it from family members, I didn't realize that holstering safely, like that technique came from someone. I didn't realize that, you know, these things were even named or attributed to certain people. Um, and then I would reach out to, you know, my friend, John Johnston and ask him like, uh, it, did somebody like come up with this? Is this like a thing that somebody did? And it's, it's extremely helpful from my perspective um, for my instructors to tell me where that is coming from. And finally, I'll just throw out that, uh, in my curriculum outline, uh, I, I have ever, all the attributions noted. I mean, I think that's, that's gotta, that's gotta be there. So, uh, and I frequently review my curriculum. Uh, I go through it and, and that, that refreshes my memory that, oh yeah, this, this came from this dude or that dude or whatever. And then constantly in class, all, as I refer to things, I'll, I do my absolute best to make references to those sources. And usually it's in the form of, you should go take a class with him. So, you know, like Scott Jelinski talks about his wave concept. If, we, if that comes up, which I, I'll usually bring it up at some point, um, so I think it's a great way of explaining some things rel rel relative to grip. Hey, Scott, go take class for him. 
Uh, Rob Latham has been hugely influential, influential on me. Go take a class with him. There's not a lot of opportunities, but if you can, it's worth it. Go do it. Mike Seeklander, um, Brian Enos always comes up in my class and he doesn't teach, but it's, Hey, go read his book because that's, that's where a lot of this for me started that the, you know, when I finally started understanding things in a little bit better, uh, way, you know, when it comes to shooting. So I, I owe all those guys a lot. Um, I mean, Matt little, he, he usually gets a few, uh, some love for me and my classes again, go train with him. Um, I'm working on getting to know Brian more and I need to take a class from Brian at some point and I hope to do so. And then probably he's going to end up getting quoted in my classes. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, he gave me a word like a few weeks ago and I still can't remember the word. So he, if you could Hypo text that to me, transient frontality, <laughs> if you could text that to me, that'd be great. I'll, I'll copy and paste that into my notes. <laughs> <laughs> if I could add one brief thing to uh, listen to cite somebody doesn't mean you have to like them or agree with them. Mm -hmm. Forget Absolutely. that. Uh, you know, uh, people only want to cite people they like, and then they backhand cite <clears throat> people they hate and they kind of attack what they said. But I cite a lot of people I don't even like, you know, or I have a personal issue with maybe they've had a big out falling out, but it doesn't matter. Information is information. And uh, the word is hypo transient frontality. <laughs> Let me try right, to we'll that <laughs> so If I could jump in and, and, and point out kind of the flip side of this coin uh, for what it's worth for the, for the viewers at home, I would actually say that if you're, if you're training under an instructor and he doesn't ever cite any other influences and he doesn't mm -hmm. ever recommend any other instructors or coursework outside of his own, for me personally, that would be a big red flag. Your mileage may vary, yes. um, but, but anybody who's teaching – uh, from a stone tablet uh, that, that they originated themselves and has nothing good to say about anybody else or nobody else to recommend. Uh, you may have some institutional inbreeding to, to uh, quote Pat McNamara at his term, institutional inbreeding. Yep. So yeah, red flag for me is if somebody doesn't cite anyone or doesn't recommend anybody other than their own coursework. Amen. Hypo transient frontality. My man. <laughs> You're welcome in class anytime now. <laughs> <laughs> now spell it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, like a spelling bee now. I will Google that now. Yeah. <laughs> so that pretty much covered all the topics that I had written out. Are there any topics that you guys feel that are important that we didn't cover? And I'm sure there are going to be tons, but is there anything that really stands out to you? So I've got a question that I'd be interested to hear y'all's thoughts on. And, uh, you know, I have my own thoughts, but I'm, I'm going to throw it out there to the group. You've developed your curriculum. You've tailored it towards your target, target audience for a particular class or for your, your client base as a whole. Uh, what are your indicators suggesting to you that it's time to modify that curriculum? Like what, what do you see that makes you think, Hey, I, I need to make this better. I need to change this. This isn't hitting home. What do you like? What's some of the stuff that'll, that'll cause you to substantially rewrite a class, a curriculum, a drill, an assessment, whatever it may be. Uh, for me, it, when I have to start teaching the curriculum and it doesn't improve the student, I get trapped sometimes. And I made a testing procedure that has trapped me immensely right now on the road. Um, and I'm ready to do away with it because it has trapped me in a, a teaching that part of the curriculum, even though maybe the student base doesn't need it anymore. So I'm not getting the results that I wanted from it. And now I'm teaching it because the test requires it. Uh, you know, so we have a lot of freedom as instructors. And if I'm just teaching the test, then I'm not teaching the client anymore. And that really, that concerns me on a deep level. Um, what would cause me to rewrite curriculum? So <clears throat> what I would consider to be my signature course or curriculum right now is still fairly young. Um, so I, I'm in a bit of an evaluation phase is the more I teach it, the more I'm identifying parts of it that I'm mostly looking at efficiency, efficiency, efficiency for communicating, um, the information, the knowledge that 
that I, you know, that I believe will help a student get to the end goal by the end of class, uh, in the best way possible. Um, so I've already reworked several sections, um, in recent history as I, you know, and, and I suspect that'll be the case as, you know, I've got this class coming up on my two day class coming up a couple of times here in the next six months. And it's going to get continually reworked and reworked. So I'm in, re, I'm in the refinement phase, um, but continuing to train with other instructors and continuing to see how others explain concepts. That's, that's definitely one thing. It's like, Oh, wow. Like I thought I had a good way of explaining that. And then you see the way Brian Hill does it. Or Chris Seipert does it is like, Whoa, you know, that's way better. So I'm going to steal that and I'm going to give them credit, <laughs> but because it achieves the end goal of getting the student to where we need, you know, where I'm trying to get them to in a more efficient manner, then like, yeah, I'm going to rework that, that part of the curriculum for sure with attribution. Closest thing um, that I have to like equate to that, because I'm, I'm not an instructor um, is you know, I've, I've changed recommendations that I've made in the past. So I used to carry for almost a year, actually, I carried in a sidecar style holster and I thought it was the bee's knees and to, until I got new information. So for me, when I receive new information that I understand and is explained to me well, um, that will cause me to change my course. Um, I, you know, I basically received a really good explanation as from John Houtman um, as how and why the sidecar style doesn't work and how it's counterintuitive to the exact purpose it's designed for. Um, and that was, it was really easy for me to change my course of action from there and, um, you know, retract that recommendation and share that new information with the people that are consuming my content. I can share with them, you know, I've, I've learned something new and, Humans can be wrong. And, um, you know, this is what I learned and this is why this is useful information to you. I think for me, it's uh, a matter of figuring out what's going to work best. It works for me. Uh, whatever process or skill or technique is effective for me and I'm going to apply it. And if I learn something new, a better way of doing it, I'm going to want to apply it as well, but only after I've tested it enough and I can articulate and prove this is actually better. But also I keep that old method in the back of my head just in case I need to go back to it for some reason, do the student or something like that. But I try to stay as current as possible uh, with what modern methodology is. That being said, like what Brian said earlier, that's counter to most law enforcement instruction. And it's sad, but it's the truth. Great question. Yep. Yeah, and, and my, it was somewhat of a loaded question that I, I only asked because I was confident that everybody on this panel would have uh, an appropriate appropriate answer. Because the, re the reality is that, uh, uh, so the, the theme I picked up on was not having ego any ego invested in your curriculum. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you do that, that's, that's where You're you get stacked. And I think we all fall victim to it to a varying or lesser degree. I, you know, every day I get on the, I get on the Facebooks and I see somebody attacking something that's near and dear to me. And I, I'm like, well, eh, you know, and sometimes I am right. And sometimes it's just ego. And eventually I come mm -hmm. around and say, okay, there's a better way. I think the reality is that uh, we should be constantly discovering uh, more precise on target ways to teach something, to explain something, and whether it's coming from other instructors, whether it's coming from us just critically evaluating what we're doing with no ego involved. And I would say that if you have a class or if you have a curriculum or if you have a technique and you've been teaching it for an extended period of time and you haven't changed it, there may be some, some e either ego or complacency involved. Um, mm -hmm. Because I don't know anybody whom, whom I respect and whom I'd want to emulate uh, who, if I take a class and then I go back and take that class a year later, I typically am able to identify a number of things that have changed and probably improved. Uh, so I would say that, that if, you're, if your classes are staying the same over long periods of time, um, then you're probably not recognizing the opportunities to improve. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, you're spot on. I mean, ego is... 
is boy that is the absolute killer to pro progress as an instructor uh, coach or as a student um and uh, uh yeah you're right it affects us all to some extent but man i work hard to try to avoid you know getting f falling into that ego trap and uh it's you know what's helpful is being associated with good people like all of you um continuing to interact in those public spaces where again you're just continually at least i am just continually questioning what i think i know as i work to communicate with others and and explain my point of view uh, and uh I, I just yeah i feel like if you do that it helps a lot to avoiding that trap of becoming ego, egotistical you know we talk about that actually quite a bit in my curriculum um you know about how the ego just gets in the way and the, the big thing is whether it's a four hour block or my two day class, the students start out by shooting a five shot group. And I ask them, how'd that go? Are you happy with it? Most people are like, no, why aren't you happy? Because I know I can do better is a common response. Yes. You know, you can do better because you have done better. You've done, you've done better and under different circumstances, well, when there's less stress, there was nobody watching, whatever it is. And so we all paint this, picture of this is who I am. And a lot of what we tell ourselves we are is it, it's maybe not a lie. It's just that we pick the best parts of ourselves to say, that's who I am. And the reality is in real life, we don't always produce or give our best selves. And it's totally okay to, to be okay with that and to recognize that and be like, you know what? Yeah. I know I can shoot a better group than that. I know I can do this other thing, whatever, better than, than what I just did. But the reality is, is what you just gave me on that target this time right here, right now, that is who you were 30 seconds ago. And you have to be okay with that. And, you know, and, and just crush that ego and not in the way that like you were talking earlier, Chris, where we just get totally down on ourselves and get um, demotivated to grow, but hopefully in the right way where we go, Hey, you know what, for whatever reason, and for me, it's, it's very effective. Just ask the question, why could I not produce what I believe I'm capable of just a moment ago? What was holding me back and identifying that and in a very non-emotional way, find the course of correction. Nice. Um, so the la last thing, last thing I'll say about this, uh, and then I'll shut up and let somebody else have the floor. So uh, most of you have probably heard the, the, the saying selection is a never ending process as it relates to like special operations units. And, and I, I like that saying um, something that, and I, I was on the same ODA. I was on the same team for a long time. And by the time I actually finally got drug kicking and screaming to go be an instructor, it was after the fact I was able to recognize that it was probably a good time to go because being in the same environment for a long time, it, it bred a little bit of complacency. Uh, however, the concept of selection is a never ending process. The way I like to think about it is I have to wake up every day and prove that I still belong on this team. What I did yesterday and for the six previous years that I was on this team, no longer matter. Today, I have to prove it anew. And I think that that attitude as an instructor is something that the longer you do it and the, frankly, the better you get at it, the easier it's gonna be to, as, as Brian alluded to, you know, like some instructors just rest on their laurels and like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm so-and-so. Uh, now, fortunately, I've got the benefit of in the tr civilian industry, commercial open enrollment, whatever industry, I'm nobody, I've been around for a year. If you told somebody you learned something, Chris Seifert, they'd say who? Uh, but I've got to wake up tomorrow and prove that I'm worth the, the money the client's paying me to make them better. If I made somebody better yesterday, it doesn't matter. I got to make somebody better tomorrow. And, uh, and I think that ad that attitude, waking up and, and proving yourself all over again today is really a key, uh, key to that mindset. If I can add briefly to that, um, you know, there's four things internally as instructors we should be doing. We should have complete concentration in the present moment as we're teaching, because that is why we're there. We're not criticizing, we're observing, which is like shot calling which is like Chris critiquing yourself. It's so important. One thing that shooting lacks is immediate feedback. Uh, unless you call your shots. That's why Riley is zeroing in on that to make a pun in there, but it is important because it gives you the only immediate feedback that you can have as you teach. 
And the same thing for us, I use the term clinician, which means there's only one set of doctors that gets better after medical school and it's surgeons because people die in front of them. And that makes immediate feedback and that changes the way you think about it. So if you're fully present and you watch somebody fail in front of you, it allows you to get better at it. If we don't have clear goals about what we're teaching, and I think for instructors, we constantly have to do that because it's so easy to gather so many things we want to do. But what, what are we clearly here to do and teach that allows us to be present and to have immediate feedback with it? And then we have to manage the challenge of skills and ratio and how much arousal we're getting from our clients. We have those four internal things in our teaching. You'll find that you're incredibly present, that you have a flow state as you teach. Uh, I often joke in my class that my clients are my drug dealers because they give me this uh, five chemicals that are self-replicating behaviors for me to make me a better instructor. And if you guys get to the point where you can kind of put those things in, I, I want to congratulate Philster on doing something really unique uh, where they realized the holster was the gateway to better instruction. None of us saw that. John and Sarah are brilliant. What a brilliant moment that was where they realized that the holster was the doorway to getting them to train better. It wasn't getting teachers. It was the gateway. And that's an incredibly unique thing. You know, John said one word to me about the Enigma, which I, I carry now. He said, it's a prosthetic. It's not a holster, which I thought was a great way to describe it. And then it made it something relative, but that was immediate feedback. And if we do these four things, I think as instructors, uh, you simply step out of it because you're the observer not the criticizer. Uh, you're living in the present. Uh, you're getting that feedback from your clients and it's, it's a self-replicating and a, and a behavior that makes you better in the long run. Good stuff. Well, I think it might be time. Way past Brian's bedtime. It is. Look at that. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> midnight. <laughs> Yeah, it's very midnight. <laughs> so with that in mind, let's get some final thoughts, some plugs, all that good stuff. Starting with Brian before he turns into a pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> I feel old jokes in that. Uh, you know, first thing is what a great time this is, though, to spend time with you guys and to talk and to share our knowledge and share our craft. Uh, that's one of the greatest things about conferences because I get to be around my peers uh, and sometimes my mentors and sometimes people that I didn't even recognize that are making a change in my life. I get to share information. I get to have discussions and there's seeds of future things coming out of this constantly. Uh, John implanted an idea in my mind uh, to treat teach a new class, which I'm working on very difficult. It, 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 it is difficult because it's something entirely new, but this time we spend together is just fantastic. And, uh, it's been a great thing. I think I've seen Riley on the road quite a bit and Chris quite a bit this year on the road. Cause we've been on the conference circuit. So what a great chance to spend time with you guys and to be a part of this. I'm honored. Uh, I learned a lot tonight. Uh, I, I took a lot of notes and, uh, you know, I may fire back some questions to you guys, but, um, you're, you're helping me develop as an instructor. And I, I, I just really enjoy that we're at a point in a world where, uh, people in different time zones can sit together and share this and, uh, everybody who watches it will get something also. And, uh, we're creating a, a big jump in our craft, which happened in martial arts. Uh, you know, when UFC came along, uh, we all realized we're full of it. <laughs> Most of us did. We had to change everything. But what really changed fighting was YouTube because it used to take a year to figure out a new technique because you'd have to be at the worlds to see it or the fight to see it. And then you try to, you know, reverse engineer it. But now uh, I can instantly go on YouTube. And if I can filter through who's got it, and who doesn't. And as I get better at it, I know I can get information immediately. I can see somebody else do it. And then I can hear somebody explain it in several different ways. And we can improve at a rate that hasn't been seen. Of course, there's a lot of danger in that. There's a lot of danger in that. I know that too, but there's a lot of danger in everything. And that's what makes life will, uh, worth living is risk and reward and trying to get better at it. So uh, I just want to thank each of you for spending time and doing this, Matt, for putting this together. I know it was like chasing cats for a while with all of us on our schedules. It was, but, yeah. yeah. It but I really, I enjoyed it. And it was just, uh, I'm, re I'm really grateful to be here. So thank you. Oh, thanks for being, being here. Now, yeah. 
Where can people find you though? So it's really easy because my wife is the indispensable organizational wizard. Uh, I gave her that title. It's completely made up and it goes back to my deep love of fantasy novels, obviously. So uh, she, we have a website, which is the complete combatant.com. You'll find all our stuff there. Uh, we're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. Uh, we do it all. We do YouTube. Uh, you can find me on Instagram as the chief chaos controller, which is a title Julie Golub gave me, which I, I relish greatly because that's basically in the nature of what I do. Um, and the schedule is there. Uh, if you'd like to host me, I have a pretty low minimum. The host trains free. I'd love to come out and train with you guys and uh, work with you guys. And uh, uh, my whole goal in life, I have one massively transformative goal is I think there's a shortcut to teaching. And, uh, you know, I'm in my mid 50 now, so I don't know how much time I have left. So I want to give all the things that I've learned as quickly as I can. Uh, to other people so that they can make it even better and be able to teach people. Cause I think we can teach people a lot quicker than we are. Uh, yeah. I, I, th I think we're just starting to understand how the brain works and uh, it's going to be really cool to be a part of this. And I hope I get to see a big part of it to fruition. Yeah. Awesome. Chris. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, following that, I don't, I don't know that I can say <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Good night, everybody. No, uh, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a privilege and a pleasure. Uh, you know, I got to spend the, the weekend with, with all four of these, uh, panelists, um, at the active self-protection uh, national conference. And, and I was excited to, to do this tonight. And again, yeah, likewise, I heard a lot of, uh, fantastic turns of phrase, a lot of interesting concepts that I want to chew on. And, and again, yeah, I may, I may end up uh, messaging people and asking you to elaborate on, on certain, certain things you'd said, uh, as far as, uh, how to, how to find me again, I, I work with citizen defense research. I've personally been on Facebook for a long time. I just personally got on Instagram within the last six months and I'm figuring that out. I'm like an old man. I'm having my kids show me how to use it. And I just got on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, but I'm mostly like following college football on there. Uh, but you can get on citizensdefenseresearch.com. Our website's under construction, but that will take you to our Facebook page. And most importantly, our Eventbrite page where you can sign up for our classes. We're going to be in Texas, this next, uh, Bandera, Texas, this next weekend, uh, running a number of classes. And then uh, we'll be in uh, Conroe, Texas at Big Tex Ordinances Range uh, coming up here in December. And we've got some slots available for that, doing a bunch of different stuff. So check us out on our uh uh, Facebook page and our uh, Eventbrite page and come see us. And we're going to have the 2022 schedule drop in here pretty soon. Um, so again, yeah, real pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Tessa. Um, you guys basically covered it. Um, I took a lot of notes. <laughs> I'm really flattered to be here and I'm really just happy to have been able to listen. There was a lot of listening and learning um, in this modcast, which there usually is, but you know, um, as far as where to find me, I'm on YouTube as Armed and Styled, and same thing on Instagram. There's just some underscores between Armed and Styled, and I have a website. Not much going on over there, so yeah, that's it. Felster. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I also work for Felster, and of course, you can find Felster at their website. They're also on. Um, Instagram and then on YouTube, they're currently known as Philly EDC. We might be changing that name here soon, though. Cool. Riley. Uh, don't have much more to add, but I appreciate the opportunity to, to be with all of you here tonight and to have what I thought was a really enlightening discussion. So thank you for all of your thoughts. And I will, even though it's sometimes weird to listen to oneself, I will probably go back and listen to this one, skip my bits and re-listen to a lot of what you all had to say. Uh, Cause I thought it was, there was a lot of really, there was, there was good meat on the bone that I probably didn't quite capture um, all of the, the good nuggets there. Uh, you can find me on, so the company page or websites, uh, concealedcarry.com uh, check out the concealed carry podcast. Um, probably get some of you scheduled up as guests that would be good and let's see uh, personally you can find me on uh, uh, Instagram Riley concealed carry is my my handle there um, and uh, let's see my personal website where I put my the training that I put on is well you can go to learn train shoot.com that's probably the easy one to remember learn train shoot.com that'll that'll redirect but that works pretty good and I got some classes coming up. I, I'm not trying to be a super 
busy on the road, you know, 20 weekends a year, 30 weekends a year, or in the case of Jedi's, you know, situation a hundred times or whatever a year. Uh, I'm not trying to be anything like that, but uh, I got a couple of classes coming up in Texas and Alabama and uh, probably one in Utah just hasn't, just hasn't uh, gone up on the site yet. And uh, there's spots available in those classes and would love to see you. Or if you want to host, um, as long as I have opening in my schedule, like I said, I, I'm only trying to do this a few times a year, but I enjoy doing it. So that's it. Cool. Cool. Well, thanks to the panel, Chris. Can I have one alibi? Just this once. Okay. So I guess I can go ahead and, and plug my blog too. I, I started yeah. amplifiedbeing.com. Uh, I started a blog. David Yamane has been encouraged me to write a book and he said, start blogging. So I created a blog, amplifiedbeing.com. Uh, uh, I ramble about everything from national defense to like medieval virtue and morality to you name it. It's kind of a potpourri of random subjects. That vegetables. Is, you know, yep. Say again. Oh, vegetables too. Do you talk about yeah, vegetables? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we talk about some vegetables. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks to the panel. Thanks to you listening or watching. Also, big thanks to our sponsors, Big Tech's Ordnance, Filster, Premier Arms, Staccato, Walther Arms. Huge thank you to the Patreon subscribers. Without that Patreon uh, support, we wouldn't be able to do this kind of stuff. We also wouldn't be able to do that training summit. Uh, speaking of training summits, I am working on May of next year to be our next one. It's going to be exciting. So far, we're two down, and they were both awesome. Next year will be even better because that's the way these things work. Um, and I try to say this at every episode. I have this at the bottom of my notes. I don't always see it, but it's support those sources that you have found to be beneficial. If you like what these guys have said, make sure you find them on social media and also find them on all those, those uh, venues on social media. Give them some likes, give them some shares, uh, follow them. Same for primary and secondary. So basically everything we're doing at primary and secondary, it's for you. Um, we're trying to provide the most amount of free information possible. Um, we have some awesome discussions about this stuff, both on Facebook and on, on the forum. Um, the forum really is, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of uh, set up to replace Facebook because, you know, we aren't going to be there forever. We will be kicked off at some point, just the way it works. Um, we do have that w w uh, website. We have all kinds of, I think, 736 different Facebook groups and the forum, video, audio podcast, video podcast, you name it. We have all this stuff. By now, you should probably have already subscribed also, I would hope. But yeah, be sure to share. You probably already... The one guy, actually, I think that might be one person with four different accounts that gives every one of these episodes a thumbs down. <laughs> thank you for the, thank you for the clicks. <laughs> um, I think that's it. Um, yeah, and I I don't know if this made the final part, but yeah, there is going to be a new series coming out that's going to go parallel with going with, uh, parallel with the uh, modcast, which is going to focus on a lot of the topics we discussed today with a set panel interviewing these fine people are going to be on there at some point, but I'm kind of excited about that. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, useful. It's going to be educational and beneficial for not only thus th those of us on the panel, but also for the listener. So it's going to be a good time, whether you like it or not. So I'm going to turn this off now. I'm going to try to edit, edit this as quickly as possible so I can put it up this weekend. So thanks again. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye.